Good afternoon, everyone. Um, congratulations on all your uh, perseverance. It's a lot of information that gets thrown at you in these two days. And so in the afternoon of the second day, I congratulate you all for being here and still being interested. Uh, to that end, since this is the second time I get to be up on stage twice, uh, yesterday I went through my overview, my thoughts on the market, what I like to look for broadly, what I am looking for um, in stocks these days. What I use my second talk for is just to talk about the companies who are presenting here, who I own in, or that I own in the Maven portfolio. And the reason that I do that is you're hearing, I mean, somebody estimated, I don't know, 200 or 300 slides that you get, that you see over these two days, right? It's a lot of information. The stories can get a little bit blurry, I am sure. So what I'm trying to do here is just my, my investment thesis for each company in about a minute, because I own 11 of the companies that are here and I'm trying to keep my talk to 15 minutes. So it's about a minute per company, so I'm just trying to go through it really quickly, what my reason is for owning each company. And the slides probably have more on them than I will even say. So they're just in alphabetical order. That, there's no order of preference here. Um, starting with Abin Resources, they have the Forest Kerr project in the Golden Triangle. What's exciting about this is that it is shaping up into a new high-grade gold discovery in an area that people are really excited about, which is the Golden Triangle. Golden Triangle has its seasonality issues, but right now we're gonna, um, they have already produced some pretty exciting results from the Golden Triangle, from uh, their project this summer. Uh, this is a really interesting project that's been put, put together that really tracks the structure, the contact between two rock types that is the most prolific in this region. And they're starting to show that their project has what it takes. So a bunch more results are pending from both the place where they've already gotten a discovery and an area down to the south where the core looks like there's more. So an exciting golden triangle uh, gold discovery. Bluestone, we heard from Bluestone yesterday. Uh, this is the Cerro Blanco project in Guat Guatemala. There's a couple reasons why Cerro Blanco is a rare gem in the world of mining projects. One, it's permitted. We all know that permitting takes a dog's age, however long that is. Um, but this is permanent. They could start building it tomorrow according to the rules of Guatemala. That's really, really key. It's already had $230 million invested, which means that the capital to get it built is quite small, and it's really high grade, and all of that adds up to very strong economics. The management team that's driving this forward is pushing hard, and this thing is going to be producing something like 140,000 ounces of gold a year in two years. So the timeline here is very short for a high grade, a new high grade gold, uh, gold mine. So that is unique and I think uniquely valuable. A lot of words on this slide. I should probably have taken those, uh, taken those back a bit. Uh, EMX royalty. So a proven project and royalty generator. And now to that, I have to specifically add strategic investor. EMX has always used its technical expertise to identify assets that are undervalued and potentially invest in them if the opportunity is, is, is there. And the key, the, the most exciting story, the most exciting part of the EMX story right now is that one of those investments has really borne fruit, which is their investment in IG Copper, which owns just, more than, just over half of the Malamish project. That deal, the Russian Copper Company, it sounds like a fake name to be honest, but anyways, it's a legit thing, the Russian Copper Company, are buying Malamish and they're buying it for a lot of money. EMX is about to get paid $89 million dollars which is, gives them a huge amount of capital to go out and do what they do. So they're about to become a really cashed up company and they are already basically cash flow neutral, which is unique in the world of exploration because they get so much money in from royalties that they've established or bought over the years. So fiscally incredibly strong, technically very strong. Um, I think just a really easy, decision in the world of uh, mineral exploration. Fireweed zinc. I said yesterday that I love zinc. I love zinc. I still think that there's a lot of room in the zinc market and I think the thing that is going, the things that are going to stand out in the zinc market going forward are the projects that are actually going to be ready to be built at some point in the medium term to feed this supply deficit that exists in a very real way. Fireweed zinc fits into that category. They have a large, high-grade resource. Um, the PEA shows that the mine would already make sense with the resource as is, but what's exciting is what they're doing now. They're drilling to make that resource not bigger 
because adding tons at the end of a mine life doesn't change the economics. They're drilling to make the resource better, which means higher grade and easy to access early in the mine plan. That kind, those kind of tons change the economics for the better, and that's what the market is going to really reward. So it's working already. The drill result that they announced recently was one of the best base metal intercepts the market has seen in years. So a lot of exploration potential here, and a management team that's very focused on turning drilling into value, not just drilling to find tons. Great Bear was the story we started with yesterday, uh, probably one that's a bit hard to forget because it's sort of the, the standout gold discovery um, of the moment, and, 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 uh, and deservedly so, that's the word I was looking for. Um, this is Red Lake. Red Lake is famous for high-grade gold, and Great Bear has found three new discoveries of high-grade gold all along the same structure. Their discoveries are spread out over several kilometers of strike, and there are huge untested areas in between. They have also only scratched the surface, and that, by that I mean literally, they're only down sort of 100 to 150 meters, whereas Golden Red Lake gets mined to kilometers depth, so, and often gets better as you go deeper. The potential for this to turn into a very significant high-grade gold deposit akin to Gold Corp's high-grade zone which made Gold Corp the company that it is, is very real. Integrity Resources, this is one of these companies that's sort of unlocking a hidden gem. So the Delamar project was tucked away in Kinross since the late 90s when they shut the project down. They had been feeding this massive mill. They'd been feeding it with very low grade ore, but the gold price was less than 300 bucks and it didn't make sense anymore. So they shut it down and in Idaho that meant they had to reclaim the whole thing within a few years. Then just, a, just two years ago, they decided, okay, we should sell this old asset. What are we going to do with it? This team came along fresh off their Eldorado Gold success and bought it. It's a two-pronged opportunity. There's already three and a half million ounces, gold equivalent ounces, at surface, probably heap leachable, a deposit that is already pretty robust. And as a PEA in the next sort of six months will show, I'm sure makes sense, makes a lot of sense as a mine already. And then there's this potential for high grade underneath. In the late 1800s, these deposits were mined underground and they were pulling ounce per ton gold from underground with like 15 gram per ton cutoffs. So there's high grade there as well. So it's a really interesting two pronged opportunity, but the value that just already exists from having unlocked this dusty asset from Kinross's shelf um, is really significant and it's being driven forward by an incredibly strong team. Morian. Morian's the one that's not like the others, right? So Morian is a dividend-paying royalty on metallurgical coal. So dividends, I mean, we talk a little bit about royalties here. EMX is certainly a royalty player, but dividends and coal are both unique amongst the companies presenting here. Um, but Morian has very limited costs. They don't own a mine. They don't run a mine. They don't explore for anything. So their costs are almost nothing. All they do is get royalty checks from the Donkin coal mine and pay out about 80% of those checks in dividends. This is starting, as in the Donkin coal mine has been in production for just under a year now. The mine is ramping up. As it ramps up, Morian's royalty increases. The first 2 million tons per year they get 2% on. After that, they get 4%, and it's going to be at least a 3 million ton per year operation. The numbers make a lot of sense. This is a company that pays you to own it, and that is management's entire focus is just returning capital to shareholders. So if you like metallurgical coal, that's sort of a bonus aspect of it, but really this is just about um, collecting checks and giving the money back to shareholders. Nevada Exploration, we will hear from here shortly. This is a novel approach to finding gold in one of the best gold regions in the world, which is Nevada. All the gold that's been found in Nevada, and there's been a lot of it, right, has been found where the rocks stick up out of the gravels, but they found basically all of the gold that's in those rocks that stick up out of the gravels, so now it's a question of, well, can we find it in the rocks that are underneath the gravels? Gravels are really hard to see through, so this company has been working for 12 or 13 years to use groundwater, because the, wa the gravels have water in them, as a way to hone in on gold in the bedrock underneath the gravels. And if you can make sure that you're looking where the gravels aren't too, aren't too deep and where you're a long strike or close to or have reason to believe it's related to gold systems that you do know about, 
it all makes a lot of sense. And the, th the key part of this story for me right now is that it seems if they make a discovery, and I think they will, it'll seem like an overnight success. Actually, it's been 12 hard years of coming up with a novel technology that's taken a lot of science and a lot of effort to get it going. But now, this is all really coming close to bearing fruit. And the goal for these guys isn't to find a million ounces. It's to find a deposit that could produce a million ounces a year. Like, these guys are looking for the big thing. And their novel approach gives them, I think, better odds than almost anybody else out there of finding that. Prize mining. Uh, copper, not a huge number of copper companies at the show, just as it turns out, but copper I'm also very bullish on, probably even more so than zinc because the fundamentals for the, we're just, we just aren't making enough copper. And I think I said in my talk yesterday between 2025 and 2030, the world's gonna be short five million tons of copper a year. That's like, it just doesn't work. The world needs that copper. Prices have to strengthen a lot. New mines have to be built. Prize mining, high-grade oxide copper in Mexico. These are mantos, so flat-lying beds. They're blue. They stick up along the side of a hillside. Um, locals have leached copper out of these high-grade mantos for years. Fragmented land position, prize managed to pull it all together. Now they're just literally getting going. They spent quite a few months here raising money and have brought in over 10 million bucks. Now they're going to get going and try and demonstrate that these things have enough continuity along strike and then going back into the hillside that there's the scale there to be interesting. I think there is. There's historic holes that's, that give confidence that these things have a lot of scale. Then the other question is metallurgy. Is it going to leach as easily as we want it to? Well, the locals have been leaching it for a long time, so probably, but they just need to tick that box more officially. If it all works, high-grade, leachable, at-surface oxide copper will be very valuable in a market that is short on copper assets. And then Vendetta Mining, another zinc project. Um, Vendetta has the Pegmont project in Australia. If you just look at the resource, you wouldn't it doesn't stand out to you for the resource on its own. But resource on its own, just like geology on its own, isn't, isn't the on it's not the only thing that matters when it comes to these companies, right? So what matters here more is where this project is and the stage that it is at. So this project is surrounded by mines, so that in itself is good. But specifically, there's two mines right nearby, one of them being the Cannington mine. Cannington's only 25 kilometers away. It's a high-grade... Uh, zinc silver mine, but its grades are falling. They've had a shaft collapse. They want to make an open pit. It doesn't really work. They basically need Pegmont's ore. Like, that is easily the answer to Cannington's problem, is that they should just buy, Pegmont, buy the Pegmont project, and then they would have the ore that they need for their mine to continue making sense. So that's one really good potential outcome, fairly near term, for Vendetta. The other is that they're about to come out with an economic study that's going to show that this thing makes sense on its own as is. So they don't need Cannington to come and buy them. Well, that's actually South 32. But they could go and build this thing on their own. There's even a third mine that's out of ore that's going to have to go into closure unless they find more ore. Pegmont could be ore for that. So I love stories that have multiple uh, ways that they could work. And this is one of those stories. There's at least three different ways that this story could work out well in the near term. Also in the near term, I think Vendetta's share price has been under a little bit of pressure for a few reasons. They've been financing, and this economic study is due out, and you know people like these things to have happened, not to be waiting for them to happen. And those are all about to resolve, so I think there's also some really good near-term potential for this share price, just as it comes out from underneath those imminent, or those, those current pressures. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Those are the companies that I own that are here. Four of those you haven't yet heard from, and these are the gentlemen that are sitting to my left. So I will jump straight into this last group of companies. So. We'll see.